Ranking Member Rowe and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you very much for holding this hearing and for allowing me the courtesy and giving me the honor of introducing my remarkable constituent, Linda Bean of East Brunswick, New Jersey. Linda and her husband, Greg, are accomplished communications professionals who have lived in central New Jersey for many years. For nearly two years now, Linda and Greg have waged a battle openly and courageously to prevent other military families from suffering the kind of loss that they endured when their son Coleman tragically took his own life in September 2008 after serving two grueling tours in Iraq. This is Linda's story to tell, and I ask you to give her your full attention. I was astounded to learn that service members who are in the individual ready reserve, as Coleman was, do not receive the kind of suicide outreach protection they need and deserve. As the Bean family and I discovered, our current suicide prevention efforts simply do not encompass these reservists uh, and a number of others. I've sent a letter to Secretaries Gates and Shinseki asking that to the extent possible under law, they implement the kind of individual ready reserve suicide prevention program that I've advocated and which is included in the House version of fiscal year 2011 National Defense Authorization Act. The very least we can do for the veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan or who are still in the reserve roles but not in units is ensure that someone from the DOD or VA checks in with them periodically over the course of a year. If we can afford to send them to war, we can certainly afford a few regular phone calls to make sure that they're doing okay, that they're readjusting to civilian life, and if necessary, that they get the help quickly uh, that they need when they need it, not after it's too late. I ask for the subcommittee's support in this effort, and I now ask you to turn your attention to someone who can speak far more eloquently than I can about the need for action, Linda Bean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holt. Mrs. Bean, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to appear before you today. As a family of both family and family, I'm very happy to share this time with you. I testify today because my son, Sergeant Coleman, 25, a veteran of two tours of duty in Iraq, shot and killed himself on September 6, 2008. I am so grateful for this opportunity. Coleman was an amazing man, and he was a star in sport. I owe a duty to my son, and I owe a debt to the men with whom Coleman served. It's my hope that these observations, drawn from a shared experience of loss, will be useful to you as you oversee the development and the implementation of suicide prevention strategies for the VA. First, I would encourage you to accept some facts. Men and women come home from service to towns and cities and families that are far removed from a VA hospital or a vet center. Many veterans who are at risk for suicide would never call themselves suicide. And some veterans, as I think you well know, either will not or cannot use VA services. I believe it is crucial for the VA to soon, immediately, identify and publicize civilian counseling alternatives, including the Soldier Project, Given Hour, and the National Veterans Foundation. Partner with civilian organizations to assure that all vets have the immediate access to the widest possible range of mental health care. And encourage meetings in your district to publicize local information on mental health resources for veterans. Second, I believe it is critical to implement a simple, straightforward public information campaign that is geared specifically to veterans' families and their friends. It may fall to a grandmother or a best friend or a favorite neighbor to speak
Seek out help for a veteran who is in trouble. Make information on available services easy to find, easy to understand, and publish that information broadly. The suicide hotline number, as you've already heard, is not enough. Finally, I would encourage you to help veterans help each other. The VA is confronting PTSD and suicide with new programs and new research, and that is all good and important work. But that has not always been the case. And there are plenty of veterans who will tell you that they have had to scrap and fight for every service they have received from the VA. In addition to the official patient advocacy and claim resolution program, please establish a separate line, one made up of your most spicy and tenacious veterans, to help ensure that no one gives up because it was too hot or because it took too long to get the service that they needed. My son joined the Army when he was 18 on September 5th, 2001. The terrifying tragedy of September 11th confirmed for my son the rights of that commitment. When he came home on his first leave, he took a pair of socks, lovingly folded by his mother, and he unfolded them and refolded them to Army specifications. It was his intention, he said, to be a perfect soldier. In the days following Colby's death, our family had the humbling experience of meeting with the men with whom Coleman had served. They traveled from all over the country to be with us and to be with each other. And it was clear to us then that many of these men were carrying their own devastating burdens. In the days after Coleman's service, I spent hours on the telephone, charged by Jim's class with some of these young men, services that would assist them as well. And I reached out first to the VA hospital in the states where those young men were. I have to tell you, my inquiries never so much results. A VA representative in Texas was horrified when I described for him my fear for a young veteran. And he said, Mr. Stinson, tell me where it is. I'll get in my car. I will go there right now. Just tell me where it is, and I'll go there. By contrast, the man in Maryland told me, if they don't walk through the door, we can't help them. Now, I know that is not true. Of course we can help them, and it is our duty to figure out how, not them. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Bean, I, I'm very sorry for your loss and want to thank you for your son's service. In your testimony, you describe how you would like to see the VA identify and describe um, identify and publicize civilian counseling alternatives. How do you think the VA should go about this? There are a number of established organizations. Most of them have um, developed since 2003 that use the services of civilian therapists in local communities to help augment whatever services the VA has available. The services are confidential, they're free of charge, they help veterans and they help their families. And I suspect if the VA posted a notice saying we'd be interested in hearing what you do, they would come to the VA. I'm not sure the VA is going to have to look that hard to find community-based organizations that want to help soldiers. In our own state of New Jersey, <coughs> there is a hotline for veterans, staffed by veterans, that developed out of the events of September 11th, a similar program. 